Whose land? It's been very interesting looking at this. It's always, always fun coming here because you sit at home and you pray for the message, don't you? And see what comes. And I first thought of this theme in March. I sat down and made seven pages of scriptures because they just came to mind one after the other. So I put them down on the computer. But I thought, that's too difficult. I'll leave that to someone more mature. And then I got an email from, I think it's Hugh Kitson. Have you ever heard of Hugh Kitson? Um, he's done some films on Whose Land, and an email came through titled Whose Land. I thought I'd better print that and read it. And I got one scripture I'd missed on from that, the very beginning. Isaiah 60, verse 12, was quoted by the late Derek Prince, who died in 2003. <coughs> and he taught Isaiah 60, 12, the nation and kingdom which will not serve you, Israel, shall perish, and those nations shall be utterly ruined. Well, that's applicable to every nation in the world. And then he goes on about prayer partners and support and the need for Britain to repent and bless the Jews. But that applies to all the nations. He talked about Whose Land Part 1, a film, and they're making Whose Land Part 2, which will come out in, in September. There's much chatter in the United Nations, the International Court of So-Called Justice, the ICJ, the media, the Archbishop of Canterbury, has suggested that Israel should not occupy the land. Does he mean they should leave Israel? What does occupy mean? Well, you occupy your house. You bought the land. One of the Jews who was speaking recently about the situation declared up to 1947, every single Jew who came to Israel purchased his land from the people who were there. Who was there? Who was occupying it? The first census was carried out by the British consulate in Israel in 1864. And the numbers I found were 8,000 Jews and 7,000 non-Jews in Israel in 1864. The population was tiny. In AD 70, at the time of Jesus, there were more like 70,000 Jews. But remember that in 135 AD, the land was said to be plowed to a depth of six feet. It was almost uninhabitable. So there were a few Jews when Mark Twain went to Israel in single-story dwellings. The land was covered in swamps and there were very few trees because the Romans cut them all down. At the time of Jesus, there might have been four to five million in Israel, 10% in the towns and 90% on the land. So there's the picture of Israel up to 1947. Today, or well, recently, one of the Arabs living in the north of Israel was interviewed on a YouTube, and he said, when the Jews came in in 1948, they came to my grandfather's house and said, would you like to stay or leave? You're free to do either. They said, we'll stay, because they trusted the Jews more than their own Arabs, and they've been prosperous ever since. And that's why there's two million Muslims in Israel who have good jobs, education, serve even in the Neset, and they are treated as equals. That doesn't happen in any of the Muslim countries around. They're better off under Israel, and they can recognize it. So did Son of Hamas. You might have read the book, Son of Hamas. It's very moving. The young man, his father was one of the five founders of Hamas. The young man was being trained to spy for Hamas, and he saw that the Israelis treated people better than his own people. And he was taught from the age of three to say, death to Israel, death to America. And he saw that was wrong and he accepted Christ and got baptized in the Mediterranean. And then he had to flee for his life to California, son of Hamas. So what's going on here? There's so much discussion. So you talk to Jesus. What's your answer? Whose land? And I realized Jesus has two types of answer. 
Either he says, it is written, and he picks out the most perfect scripture. Have you noticed that? It's always the most perfect scripture of all the Bible. He'll give you a one-liner, it is written, and that's the answer. That will do. Or he'll ask a question in return to make you think. And I thought he asked me the question, why are you asking? Why have you got to ask whose land? Do you ask whose land England is or whose land your house is? Isn't it fairly obvious who is occupying a plot of land? Why are you asking? Because the world is taking sides, one way or the other. Well, there's a little organisation that spoke at Chesham a couple of years ago called Solutions Not Sides. Sides is not going to bring peace. Two states won't bring peace. There are different states around since the carving up of 1922, but it didn't solve the problem of those who want all the land for themselves. The Jews would like a bit of it for their own homeland. So my pages come to 10 pages of scriptures, and it's very hard to condense. Let's see where we get to. I shall only quote a little of it. Don't worry, won't be here till midnight. But I think Jesus might have homed in for his one-liner on Leviticus 25, 23, when he said, or the Lord said, through Moses in Leviticus 25, 23, the land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. So there's your answer, the land is the Lord's. Well, of course, the whole earth is his. The whole earth. In fact, he says somewhere, the land and the sea is mine. I can't find the reference, never mind. Then Leviticus 26 is the blessings and the curses. If you obey, you have the blessings. But if, it's always worth underlining but if, isn't it? There's a but if after every promise. Leviticus 26, 32. When you disobey, I will lay waste the land. We thought that the Babylonians laid waste to the land, but the Bible says, I will lay waste the land. God takes full responsibility for laying waste the land. Leviticus 26, 40. But if they will confess their sins and the sins of their fathers. The prophets knew these scriptures and understood them so well. They are the heroes, aren't they, of the Old Testament. And Peter said to the unbelieving Jews, you are heirs of the prophets and of the promises. We are heirs of the prophets. We can read as they did and understand these words. Daniel 9, Daniel confessed his sins and the sins of his fathers. He recognized the exile was because they had disobeyed. And for disobedience, you'd be exiled. When I searched exile, I found the word there 76 times. The Jews were very slow to heed the warning of the prophets. They didn't heed the warnings. So Habakkuk, Isaiah, Jeremiah went on warning. Repent or exile. Repent or exile. But they didn't listen. And then Leviticus 26, 42. God promises, I will remember my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will remember the land. So God hasn't forgotten the land. Where shall I go next? I think I'll jump to some interesting comments I found by people of the past. John Owen, 1649. I think he was one of Cromwell's men of that period. 1649, just before Isaac Watts was born. He wrote, the bringing home of his ancient people to be one fold with the fullness of the Gentiles is the prophecy. The bringing home of his ancient people. He saw in 1649 that these dispersed Jews around the world were going back to their own land. That's just before that census when there were so few people there. Israel was so empty. It reminds me of a joke, actually. Three and a half thousand years ago, Moses was there waiting to go into the land. And a Jew, an Israeli, told this at a conference with Muslims, and I think it was a UN meeting. 
He said, the story goes that Moses, when he got the water out of the rock, was able to wash his clothes. And he put them down on the bank of the water. When he got out, an Arab had next to them. Some people laughed, but the Muslim present was furious. And he said, we weren't even there then. <laughs> to which the Israelis said, now that we've agreed on that, I think it's very clever. They were there first by some 2,000 years. Not that that means anything today, because, well, we keep turning these things over in our minds as we try to get something out of it. John Wesley, 1700s, 100 years later, John Wesley wrote, so many prophecies refer to this grand event, the restoration of Israel, that it is surprising any Christian can doubt it. And these are greatly confirmed by the wonderful preservation of the Jews as a distinct people to this day. When it is accomplished, it will be so strong a demonstration of both the Old and the New Testaments and their revelations, as will doubtless convince many thousands of deists, God-believers, in countries nominally Christian. John Wesley. Uh, in about 18, just shortly before 1815, Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon. Napoleon heard Jews in Paris saying next year in Jerusalem. He asked, what are they talking about? How long ago did they leave Jerusalem? 1800 years. And Napoleon said, in that case, surely they will return because of their faith in returning. I didn't know Napoleon was a prophet. Charles Spurgeon, 1864, four years before that census, pre preached on the restoration and conversion of the Jews. Spurgeon, there will be a native government again. There will be the form of a body politic. A state shall be incorporated and a king shall reign. Well, that's still future, isn't it, when Jesus returns? Israel has now become alienated from her own land. Her sons, though they can never forget the sacred dust of Palestine, yet die at a hopeless distance from her consecrated shores. But it shall not be so forever, for her sons shall again rejoice in her. Her land shall be called Beulah, which means married. Isaiah 62, 4. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall her sons marry her. Quotes, I will place you in your own land, is God's promise to them. Straight from the Bible. God bless him, Charles Spurgeon. And finally, Bishop J.C. Ryle in 1868. He preached on scattered Israel to be regathered. Quotes, however great the difficulties surrounding many parts of unfulfilled prophecy, two points appear to my own mind to stand out as plainly as if written by a sunbeam. One of these points is the second personal advent, or the second coming, of our Lord Jesus Christ before the millennium. The other of these points is the future literal gathering of the Jewish nation and their restoration to their own land. Out of the 16 prophets of the Old Testament, there are at least 10 in which the gathering and restoration of the Jews in the latter days are expressly mentioned. Did you get that? At least 10 of the prophets clearly predict the return of the Jews. And he, 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 this went on to quote 10 quotes from, the, from those 10 of the 16 prophets, concluding, I believe there is one common remark that applies to them all. They all point to a time which is yet future. They all predict the final gathering of the Jewish nation from the four quarters of the globe and their restoration to their own land. I ask you then to settle it firmly in your mind that when God says a thing shall be done, we ought to believe it. Brilliant, J.C. Ryle. And of course, it's been fulfilled in our own land, in our own lifetime, for those of us who were born uh, before 1948. I was born in 45. So there's a number of relevant scriptures, and there's a lot about the land 
So sometimes it's quite interesting to take the first. The first reference is often very significant. And I saw something I hadn't seen before. Maybe you all have, but I hadn't seen how big this was. Genesis 12 is the famous promise to Abraham, which you know, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse or destroy. And all peoples will be blessed through you, all peoples, all nations. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, Genesis 12, 6, to your offspring, I give this land, to your descendants. Now just hold on to that phrase. That's once. Genesis 13, verse 15. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. Got that? You and your descendants. That's the second time. That's Genesis 13. Five years later, Genesis 15, I think it's five years later, when the Lord makes the covenant with Abraham, saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. Got that? From the river of Egypt, the Nile to the Euphrates, that's big. That's the third time. Uh, and it comes again in Genesis 17, verse 8. The whole land of Canaan, which is defined as from Euphrates to the Nile, where you are now an alien, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Now, we all know it goes on to promise the land, land to the descendants of Isaac and Jacob. But hold on, we've missed something. Who are the descendants of Abraham? Who was his first child? Ishmael. Well, yes, so what? But at that very moment, I was finishing a book, The Grace Outpouring, about the place in Pembrokeshire that's a Christian retreat that's been a blessing to many for the last 20 or 30 years. I thought it's following on from that wonderful intercessor, Rhys Howells, who was an intercessor during the war. In the last page of the book, he's giving thanks to the Lord for the Jews being able to go back to their land, uh, continue to pray for them, and he says, and pray for the Arabs, because the locals there were not being invaded, but there was an influx of people, rather less than we've had in the last 20 years, I might add, but an invasion of people, and so he said, and pray for them too. Well, the Lord looks down and sees lost Jews and lost Muslims who don't know him. And we've been going through Ezekiel 70 times. Then they will know. Then you will know. God is concerned for the Jews and the non-Jews. We're all his creation. And we know we've left out the, the Arabs, the Muslims, in all this. And then when I've been talking to Muslims, twice or three times I've shared with Muslim men Genesis 17, because they don't know it. They don't know the blessing in the Bible for their Ishmael. They don't know what it says, but Genesis 17 has this piece, if I can find it. Here we are. Genesis 17, 18. This is where God said to Abraham, because no, you see, Abraham clearly loved Ishmael, his firstborn son, clearly loved him. And so when the blessing is, is made to him and down to Isaac, Abraham said to God, Genesis 17, 18, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Because he loves Ishmael. And what does God say? Verse 20. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. So there's a blessing on Ishmael, which, as I said, Muslims don't know, nor do they know in chapter 25, Genesis 25, you've got this little phrase throughout Genesis, this is the account of, 10, ten times. This is the account of Ishmael, and it lists the names of his 12 sons. 
and it says his descendants settled in the area from Hevelar to Shur, which is down near the border of Egypt, which is where the Amalekites, who were his descendants, were the first tribe to oppose the Jews in the Exodus when they left Egypt. And then says, and they lived in hostility towards all, towards all their brothers. But they're not supposed to. Lived in hostility. And then I thought, yes, brothers tend to do that. Cain and Abel. It's happened since the beginning. But we're told, love the Lord your God and love your neighbour and, of course, your brother. If you have something against your brother, sort it out. And so you look at the place today and you think, well, that's very interesting. God's left it to both of them. And they were quite close to one another. When Abraham died, Ishmael and Isaac buried Abraham. They weren't far apart, but they were in hostility to one another. The King James Version says that, um, he will live in the presence of his brothers. I can't find the scripture. I've got too many. That'll do. He, he, he lives in, in their presence. And they're in the presence of their, of their brothers now, but they're still at war with each other. Isn't that interesting? So is a two-state solution in the Bible? We're all to be one. Now, we learned this wonderfully at Mount Carmel when we went there for a two-week course in 2006. And there were four pastors at the Mount Carmel Assembly. You might have heard of it. Or Al Carmel, the Light of Carmel. It was a congregation of about 400, of lots of nationalities, founded by David Davis, American, and his co-pastor Peter Sukahira, who is a Japanese-American-Israeli, who both have Jewish-American wives, so they made Aliyah, and they started a rehab place at Mount Carmel that became the church. Two of their first converts, disciples, were Pastor Yusuf Dakwa, a local Arab guitarist musician, and Pastor Dennis Sayeg. He had a lovely story how he got converted. He was a Jew of the Jews. His parents were expelled from North Africa, along with 850 exiles from North Africa who went to America or Israel in 1948. And this young man was doing his national service, and he saw an attractive American blonde and said, come for a drink. She said, no. He saw her the next night and said, come for a drink. She said, no, I have to get up early tomorrow to pray. Good night. And he saw her a third time and said, why did you say no to me? I thought he thought he was cool. And she said, because you don't read your scriptures. Go and read your Psalm 22 and your Isaiah 53 and come back to me. He went home and read them, found the girl again and said, I found my Messiah. She said, come to Bible study. And he became a pastor. He told that story to us, a group of about 100. And then the, the local guitarist, Arab man, Yusuf Dakwa, told his story. His mother was a Roman Catholic of sorts. Father was nothing. He loved music. He played the guitar. He wanted to join a group. And he found a group of Jews, young men. And after some months, he discovered they believed in Yeshua. Well, he didn't, because in 1948, his parents left their farm. The local, local Arabians, local Palestinian Arabs told him, you leave your farm, we'll drive out the Jews, you'll get it back. So they left their farm and they didn't get it back. So he didn't like Jews, but he liked music. And he came to believe. So now they've got a congregation that speaks local Arabic and speaks the local Hebrew, as well as English and the Russian language. That's Mount Carmel. So these men then quoted Ephesians 2. One new man out of the two. This is the answer for Israel. It is the only answer that will bring peace. When the Orthodox and the Druze, not so much them as the other Muslims, come to Christ. They said, we see hope. Because Jacob and Esau, two brothers who were choosing to live apart like in two states, they came back together. God brought them together. God told Jacob to go back, didn't he? And he met up with Esau, and they embraced one another. So the Jews in Mount Carmel said, we think that could be prophetic. We see Muslims coming to, Jew, coming to Jesus more quickly than the Orthodox Jews, who will often campaign outside a, a free church and throw stones at the windows. 
during their meetings on the Shabbat. So it goes on. Whose land? It, the answer is it's the Lord's. How are we to live? It, Jesus clearly wants one state, all under him. And until we're all under him, we won't have peace. The two-state solution is a nonsense. It's been proposed five times at least. The Arabs always say no, because their Quran doesn't allow them to say yes. So when it comes to the crunch, they all refuse every two-state solution, and probably always will. So why any Westerner backs it? Because they're ignorant of the scriptures and don't understand the Lord's will, is that brothers learn to dwell together in unity. Psalm 133, how wonderful it is when brothers learn from Jesus to dwell together in unity. But it's interesting that actually Ishmael has also promised this land, and they do have that land from the Euphrates to the Nile, and how much of it have the Jews got? And they're supposed to be sharing it. And if they could learn to live together, everybody would. So the, the, the Lord has fulfilled it. That land is in the hands of the descendants of Abraham. I find that fascinating. But they're, to, they're brothers who are supposed to live together, and they haven't learned to do so. so I mean, we have this saying in Psalm 122, I think, verse 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But we, we all do that. But where's the peace? Actually, Jerusalem is quite peaceful. It's the rest of Israel that's under attack. But anyway, you know, there's the scripture, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Well, yes, I think uh, pray, I, I think I'm prayers right. were led by the Spirit. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I believe I'm right in saying that Israel is the only country in the whole of the world that actually has God in its name. El Salvador Israel. Oh, yes. appears to, but the El in El Salvador means something else. Like the Salvador or something, yes. That's the thought, Israel, yes. El, El being God. So when you see the size of that land, 300 million Muslims around little tiny Israel, and few of them are Christians. It's a miracle they've survived these wars. It's, and you just watch and pray. Well, I also went a bit further on the phrase, all the nations. Most nations are against Israel. Well, I think I thought on October the 7th, they should have sent in Bibles and bread, and not bombs, to say, here's what's doing good, you're doing bad. And the world might have seen the difference between the Israelis and the Palestinians and Hamas. Instead, they're killing each other, and the world is turning against Israel. Oh, those poor Arabs, they've got nothing. Yeah, that's their fault. Because they had a prosperous land when it was given to them in 2005. Gaza was prosperous, and they ruined it. And we're sending money there all the time. And what do they use it for? It's such a catastrophe, the way the UN has behaved. But so this phrase, all the nations, it's in seven places at the end of Zechariah when all the nations turn against Israel. It hasn't happened yet. No. You look at the scriptures that are precisely to be fulfilled before Jesus returns. And that's one, all the nations will turn against them. And then there'll be a mark of the beast without which you can't buy and sell. There'll be 100 pound hailstones. There are a number of things to come before Jesus returns and the 1,000 years of peace begins. Until then, you'll have trouble. Now, I thought I'd end it with Luke chapter 21. Um, because well, it's, it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as you know, these end-time words. And it says so much when you get to the words of Jesus to sum it up. Luke 21, verse 8. Watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilences, yeah, COVID-19, in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. So Jesus is not surprised. He said it's going to happen. Why are we surprised when what Jesus said would happen does happen? Wars will continue until the end. How sad. But we are to just, well, he says later in that chapter, when you see these things beginning to happen, lift up your heads, because your salvation is drawing near. So we have some joy, not in this life, but in what we see beyond it. And that connects with Hebrews 12, 2, where Jesus 
No, the writer of the Hebrews says that Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the, endured the cross in shame. It said he endured the cross in shame and got right back up to work again after three days. So if Jesus could endure the cross in shame because of the hope beyond the, the grave, we should have our joy not in this life. It's difficult, but in what's beyond Beyond, what's beyond the, the resurrection, beyond this life. And that's where our joy should come from. It's wonderful how some of these persecuted Christians around the world radiate such joy. They're not expecting an easy life. They're looking forward to the next. And we should look forward to that. The older we get, Barry. <laughs> we should do, shouldn't we? We should wish I did. But no, we're so fixed on this life. That's poor little me. So... Lift up your heads because your salvation is drawing now. So, Lord, we thank you for this time together. Thank you very much. Thank you for your holy word, your holy spirit, your holy servant, Jesus. And everything, that, everything about you that is so good and precious. And now we ask you to give us your grace and peace and lead us by your spirit this coming week. And help us to abide in fellowship with you and to remember you morning, noon, and night, as our Lord, Saviour, and Friend. Amen. Amen.